Okay, so we've got a unit circle. <laughs> yes, woohoo. The unit circle is your friend. Okay. It's as you can make it's really easy. Why do you know Okay, so we we need to figure out what a wave function is. First of all, what's a function? It's a mathematical function. You all should know this. I forget the official definition. Yeah, where you put a value in and you get another value out. Okay. Be a little bit more, I don't know, mathy or um, what, what does it demonstrate? What does a function demonstrate? It demonstrates a what? Um, trend? Not a trend. Yeah. A result? No. Well, kind of, but no. Um, okay, so what do we what do we call those kinds of things? It's a what 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 am I looking for? It, it demonstrates a what between something. Relationship. A relationship between something, right? It's a function. A function demonstrates, it's a rule that demonstrates a relation between something. If I put this number in, my rule says that I get this number out, right? And that's what we we need. It's a wave function. If I if I put a certain number in, I'm going to get a position of my wave out of it. Okay, that's a wave function. I'm going to get a position out of it. Um, what would I probably put into my function to determine where the position is? I'm going to demonstrate a relationship between what and the position of my wave. Height. That would maybe be in the function, but would time time okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna create a relationship between time and position. So that's kind of our focus. So if we place a unit circle at the beginning of an x y coordinate at the origin of an x y coordinate plane and follow the value what? of sine, it does that randomly. Why? Huh? The function auction? Yeah, we're learning functions in seventh grade. Our teacher did this function auction. Do I dare ask? <laughs> what is, well, you don't want to know. I do want to know. Tell me the details. Uh, I think she gave our she she designed this figure and gave us all a pack with functions in it. It was to figure out what was a function and what wasn't a function. I don't remember any of the words. I think each one of those are not functions. Mm -hmm. She like auctioned them off and you didn't want to buy the not functions, but you only had a certain amount of points. So you didn't want to. <coughs> it, it, was, it was weird. My daughter has her class right now, and instead of being function options, you know what they're doing? They're doing a Christmas party. Oh. Okay. So, so what if we place the unit circle on an, oh, at the origin of an xy coordinate plane and we follow the value of sine? as we go around the circle by advancing from a value of zero radians to pi over two radians. Okay, so I have my unit circle and then I also have an xy coordinate plane here. And if I go to, if I start at zero radians, right, I'm, I'm here around my unit circle, what's my value of sine going to be? Zero. Zero. Okay, so I'm going to place a zero right here. And then what is the value of sine of pi over two radians? One. One. So my position is going to go up one. Okay? And I'm going to be, I'm going to stay in place here. And I'm just going to vibrate back and forth because that's what a wave is, right? You may think that a wave moves, right? A wave moves, but at this point of the medium, whatever the medium happens to be, the only thing that's happening is that point is bouncing up and down. Okay, so if I have a, a wave, okay, this 
part of the medium right here is just bouncing up and down as the wave passes through it, right? It doesn't go forward. Like if I have a rope, the piece of rope doesn't move. It just bounces up and down, right? So we're going to use this to model the motion of a piece of a wave or a particle of a wave. So then the value of sine decreases back to zero. And then it goes down to negative one and then back up to zero, right? So it, it's just this repeated motion up and down. And our following of the value of sine as we go around the unit circle models that, okay? It tells me what the value of this is going to be. So we want to consider the creation of the up and down motion of a wave as a function. If we use the xy coordinate plane as our reference, what's the variable that we're going to try to find at any point in time? What's, what variable is represented by this axis? I'm making it too difficult. It's y, right? Okay, so we might call this simplistically the function y, okay, y of something. And we've already asked the question, what would the value of this function depend on? What did we say? The time. Time, right? Okay, so we might symbolize this function by saying y with respect to time, right? So the value of function y at time t, okay? So that's function notation, right? We have a, we name our function, this is the name of the rule, and this is what the rule depends on, or, and we're going to say then the rule is this, right? So if we're going to keep track of progress of a sine wave over the course of time, what's the first thing we want to add to our function? Y of t is going to equal what? X. No. Over a course of time. Isn't it just going to equal the sine of something? y of t is going to equal the sine of something, right? We're building a function here. We want to add sine of something, okay? The question now is the sine of what? Let's consider our case where one cycle will be completed in one second. During that one second, in order to get one complete sine wave, we would have to make the angle increase from what to what? In order to get one complete sine wave going around the circle here, I'm going to have to go from what? Zero to two pi. Okay, so how would we accomplish this? I want to go from 0 to 2 pi in one second. One second. So how would I get this point? 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 What would I multiply 2 by pi by in order to get that particular value? Wouldn't I just multiply it times t? Okay, so if I say 2 pi times 0.5 seconds, I'm going to be at 1 pi, right? If I multiply 2 pi by 0.25 seconds, I'm going to be at um, pi over 2, and the value of that would be 1, correct? So at time 0, my angle is going to be 0 radians right? And the sine of zero radians or the sine of two pi times t, since it's at zero seconds, is going to be what? What's the sine of zero? 
Zero, right? Okay, so let's say that I'm at 0.25 seconds. My angle is now pi over 2 radians. Okay, at that point I'm at a value of 1. Okay, at 0.5 seconds, my angle would be pi, right? And then I'd be back to zero again, okay? And then at 0.75 seconds, I'm going to be at 3 pi over 2, or 3 halves pi. And then my value of sine is going to be negative 1, correct? Yep. And then at 1 second, I'll be back at 2 pi or at 0. And my value is going to be back to zero. So this in its simplest form would be kind of the simplest wave function we could create. Right? Y of t equals or my output equals this input. And all I'm doing is saying if I've got a part of a second, I'm going to have part of this circle here. So if we left our function as it is, this would be describing this would be describing a single wave traveling through time at one hertz. But what do I do if I have a wave or I want a wave that has more than one cycle per second? How might we accomplish that? What's the number of cycles per second called? Huh? No, not the wavelength. Frequency. Frequency, okay. So maybe I could multiply by frequency. Maybe I could say y of t equals the sine of 2 pi times frequency times time. Okay, so now let's say if my frequency was 2, I'm going to go through two revolutions in one second, right? And that's what this means. I'm going to multiply one complete circle by whatever that frequency is. If my frequency is 10, I'm going to multiply that. I'm going to go 2 pi radians 10 times in one second, right? Okay. Or I'm going to go however many radians that equals 2 pi times the frequency times however many seconds I have. And that's going to tell me where my position is as it moves up and down, right? Okay, I'm just going back and forth, back and forth, waving in the, the breeze, as it were. And we've now made it so that this isn't just one wave, this is any number of waves per second that we want because we're multiplying 2 pi times the frequency. I'm going around the circle as many times as I want to. Now we've got an opportunity to decrease the number of our terms. Because the number of radians the circle travels with each second is 2 pi times the frequency, we can give this term here a special value. We can say 2 pi times the frequency, um, and this is going to become um, the angular the angular frequency. Okay? This is simply the number of times I go around the circle per second. Okay? This is the number of times I go around the circle per second. And we're going to symbolize that with the Greek letter omega. If you take physics, you may also know that Omega is the angular velocity 
in rotational motion. Something we didn't get a chance to get to last year. Huh? Because of the pandemic. Then our formula becomes y of t equals the sine of omega t. Okay? Do you feel like we're creating a function here? Something that's doing something? I do. Okay, now, this is going to allow us to go back and forth between these two positions as many times per second as our angular frequency tells us that we are. Okay, but what if we wanted to increase the amplitude of the wave? What if I wanted to go this high and this low in my wave? What am I going to have to do to this formula to increase the distance that I go up or down? This value right now ranges between 0 and 1, right? Or 1 and negative 1. This value ranges between 1 and negative 1. What if I want to make it range between 2 and negative 2? What would I have to do to this quantity? Yeah. Would we have to change that amplitude? Okay, but how are you going to do that? How am I going to make this, instead of going from 1 to negative 1, which it does right now, how am I going to make it go from 2 to negative 2? Side by 2. Okay. Or what if I want to make it go from any number to any number, multiply it by what? Okay, or call that number a, maybe a constant. Okay. So I'm going to put multiply by a constant. So now I have y of t equals a sine of omega t. Okay? So my wave formula now takes into account for the frequency of the wave, the amount of time that the wave has, has traveled, and the amplitude of it. And if I put all that together, I get the position of the wave in that up or down direction. Okay? Now, we're going to make this a little more complicated. At this point, is our wave traveling anywhere, or do we just have a single point bobbing up and down between negative 1 and 1? Right now, we just have this, right? We need to make our wave travel. Now, even though we show the waveform on an xy coordinate plane, right, normally we'll show the wave like this, right? It's not really traveling. We just show this to give you the visual impression that it, it's moving up and down, and it could move in a direction. But it's not really moving now because that's not what this point here is doing. We've got this point that's bobbing up and down here. As it bobs up and down, we also want it to go in the horizontal direction. Okay, we also want this to go in the horizontal direction. So, that's all our function is doing so far, varying the value of y over time t. Since we want the wave to travel, let's say in the x direction, we need to add a new component to our function. Okay, and we're going to call this a distance component. Okay, and we're going to say that our function is now y of x and t. You've probably never seen this notation before. You've probably seen the other function notation before where it just depends on one thing, 
but now our function depends on two things. It depends on an X position and on a time. Okay, it depends on how far we've traveled and on the time. So I've got to make something in my function cause the X value to increase. Okay, and here's where it gets a little sketchy. Uh -oh. Let's let X equal the distance traveled in meters. Okay, that makes sense. Our wavelength is in meters or parts of meters, right? Nanometers or whatever it is, our wavelengths of meters. But now we have a problem because we need values in our function in radians. Okay, we're dealing with radians. So we're going to have to make our values convert meters into radians. So consider that one revolution of the unit circle is the same thing as going the distance of one wavelength. Okay, the distance of the unit circle, if I go around the unit circle, I go one wavelength, one lambda, right? So would that not make sense then that I could say that two pi radians is equal to the number of meters in one wavelength? Okay, we're setting two pi radians, and I'm just going to put radians here to remind us that that's two pi radians, and wavelength is in meters, radians per meter. So it doesn't really matter how long our wavelength actually is. We're going to convert the number of radians that we have in 2 pi to however many meters that is. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we aren't going to keep it like this where we can visualize what we're actually talking about. We're going to call this conversion factor K. So the distance that our component of our wave function becomes, becomes Kx. And let me show you what that means. If, let's say our wavelength happens to be 10 meters, or let's, I'm sorry, let's say we go 10 meters, right? But let's say our wavelength is um, five meters, okay? Let's say our wavelength is five meters. I'm converting two pi to whatever that wavelength is. And I've got radians here and meters on the bottom, and the meters are going to cancel out. So two pi radians for five meters, okay, two pi radians for five meters, and the meters are going to cancel out, and that's going to leave us with a certain number of radians, right? So that would leave us with a distance of four radians, or four pi radians, not two pi radians, right? So 10 divided by five is two times two pi. So instead of saying I went 10 meters, because each two pi radians is five meters, now I'm saying I'm going four pi radians. It's the same thing. Four pi radians in this case is the same thing as 10 meters. So what we're essentially doing here is multiplying by a value of one. This value equals this value, or this concept equals this concept, this many radians, is this many meters, right? And that would be the length of one wave. But I want to say that in radians, I don't want to say it in meters. So if I say that my wave has traveled 10 meters, what I would rather say is it's traveled four pi radians. Yeah. Can I go to sure. Okay. So what happens to 
the value of x, what happens when the value of x begins at 0 at time 0, um, we have um, a distance of 0 pi. So kx essentially equals 0 radians, right? Okay. What happens when this x term has increased to a value of one wavelength? How many radians have I gone? If I've gone one wavelength, how many radians have I gone? That's once around the circle, right? So two pi radians. Okay, what happens if kx equals two wavelengths? I've gone how many radians? Four pi radians. Okay, so all we're doing is we're converting our angular frequency here, or not our angular, we're converting our, uh, our term, our distance traveled by x, the distance traveled by x, to a number of radians, so that fits with my formula. So now not only do we have a point of our wave bobbing up and down in the y direction, as it's doing this, it's also traveling in the x, x direction. Now, to combine the two components, we, we would subtract the value in radians of the time component from the value and radiance of the movement component. So what we're going to say now is y of x t equals kx minus sine of omega t. Okay, so we've subtracted the value of the time component from the value of the distance component. This is the mathematical formula describing the motion of a traveling wave in one dimension. This is a simple type of wave function, and all we've done is said, I can use this function to say that my wave is at this point in space. That's all this does is say that at time t, my wave is at this point in space, okay? Or it's at this point in space, or it's at this point in space. So that's what a wave function does. And you can see how that would be something that would be what investigators would want to do to create a, an atomic model. I want to show where the electron is going to be around the nucleus at time t, okay? So this is a mathematical formula describing the motion of a traveling wave in one dimension. In general, we symbolize the mathematical formula that describes a wave function with the Greek letter psi, that little trident. So we would say psi of xt equals kx minus sine of omega t. Okay? Now, in classical... I'm sorry? I just put psi there instead of y. Kind of looks like a y, doesn't it? That's why we use it. Or you can think of a wave as something that belongs to Poseidon and Poseidon used to try it, right? Anyway. Now, in classical physics, this formula describes the location of a particle traveling in a wave in one dimension. Using calculus, we could also describe the motion of this particle. We could describe its velocity and acceleration. And in this would involve the process of differentiation. Right? The velocity is the first derivative of the position function. 
The acceleration is the second derivative of the position function. And those of you in calculus have now gotten to the point where you understand what that means. Mm -hmm. Now remember that to form a standing wave in the circumstance of a guitar string, and that's kind of our model, the wave has to be reflected back from one end in a way that will be inverted and then add to the next wave. Remember we had to, with our wave, we had to have our wave be inverted and then come back, what a terrible wave, be inverted and then come back and meet the next incoming wave, right? And that's what creates a standing wave. And that only happens when I have a wave of a certain energy for that particular system. Now, remember that, oh, so we said that we can model this process by having two waves traveling in opposite directions meet each other, okay? So I can pretend that one wave is traveling this direction and one wave is traveling that direction. And the standing wave will be the sum of those two waves. When they meet each other and they interact with each other, the standing wave will be the sum of those two waves added together. Because the wave is traveling in opposite directions, we need to change the sign combining the components from minus to plus. And what we're going to end up doing then is saying psi of x and t equals um, kx minus sine of omega t plus, I'm sorry, yeah, plus kx plus sine of omega t. And this is the thing that's going to make it travel one direction or another. If I have a negative sign here, it's going to travel in the positive x direction. If I have a plus sign here, it will end up traveling in the negative x direction. And if I add the two together, I get the total standing wave. Oh, how come that didn't print? Okay. So it can be shown mathematically that this is going to be equal to, and I think I'm going to have to confirm this because I always have to look this up. So, sorry, AE times this line. Okay, mathematically, what's E? Is that it's the natural logarithm, right? So 2.1, whatever that was. So it's the natural logarithm, right? So A times E times the sine of KX minus omega T. And let me just, no, we'll go with that. That's what this, so mathematically, we can show that this equals this. We're not going to, we don't really care, but this is just a different way of writing this out. This wave function, the function describing the position of a particle in space and time forming a standing wave moving through space can be seen as the beginning point to describe the waveform of an electron in space around a nucleus. Remember that that wave will be much more complex. It'll be a three-dimensional wave. Additionally, in order to completely describe the wave, the mathematical formulation must show um, not only the position, um, uh, the velocity and acceleration of the part. It must also show the velocity and acceleration. In other words, it needs to show the position and the motion. Don't freak out. The process of accomplishing this uses something called partial differentiation, which is something that you would learn about after calculus BC. This would be something you would learn about if you took advanced topics in math. We would go through this. Okay. Uh, but this involves partial differentiation. 
and that's a, a technique that we use for derivatives in multiple dimensions rather than just one dimension. So, um, and with reference to time, the symbology used to describe this is this, and I'll, I'll go through this here just real quickly, um, but don't worry about this. I'm just showing it to you to see how, you know, show you what it looks like, okay? This is, this is really um, advanced math, and you wouldn't be expected to know anything like this on the AP test. I just want to show it to you just so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so this is the Schrodinger wave equation. Okay, you don't need to know this. I'm just providing a brief description. Okay, so this is the Schrodinger wave equation. We've got this term plus this term equals this term. And in this case, what do you think E equals? Energy. That's going to equal energy. Okay, and it looks like it, it equals some kind of total energy, right? There's things that I'm adding together to get this total energy. Okay, and you also recognize that I've got this element here. This is just the symbol for a wave function. Except in this case, not only do we have a reference to time, in this case we have a reference to all three dimensions, not just x, or not just y, I mean, we are going to travel in the x, y, and z direction all at the same time. So the, this equation gives us the total amount of energy in the wave with reference to the three-dimensional nature of the wave. What am I probably adding together to get a total amount of energy? What two types of energy am I probably adding together related to the electron to give me a total amount of energy? What two types of energy do you know about? Potential and kinetic. I'm probably adding symbols for kinetic energy and potential energy to add together to give me the total energy. That's all this function is, is it tells me how much energy that electron contains in that particular orbital. Okay, in that particular orbital. And one of the things that you can see here is that I've got something squared and that refers to the second derivative, and the second derivative is the acceleration. So that's the, that's the component that refers to the kinetic energy, and then this is the component that's going to refer to the amount of potential energy that that wave has. So just real quickly, psi is the symbol that represents the wave function. The wave function is a mathematical description of the position of a particle in space forming a three-dimensional standing wave and can be seen as the beginning of point to describe the three-dimensional wave motion of an electron in space around the nucleus. It's where the thing is at. Okay, now notice that we've got this description here. The psi is just saying this is a wave function. It's not telling you what the rule for that function is. It's just saying this is a wave function with respect to something. Okay, the first term of the equation, this strange symbol here is Planck's constant. Um, and if I put a little slash through it like that, um, it tells me that that's referring to the momentum of the particle. Okay, so from this starting point of a description of the position of the electron, this is the position of the electron. The model needs to modify the position by accounting for where it's going. And this stuff relates to the acceleration. So this part of it tells me where it's going. This part of it tells me this is where it is. This is the part of it that says I'm going to this place, okay? So this term incorporates mass into the equation. 
This term is a three-dimensional calculus symbol that provides information about the motion. Ultimately, this term describes the kinetic energy of the electron. Then the second term, this term acknowledges that the interacting electrical and magnetic forces within the atom will also modify the motion of the electron. Ultimately, this term represents the potential energy of the electron. This term says, the first term says, this is how fast I'm going and this is the direction that I'm going in. This says, this is how all of the other electric fields and magnetic fields in the atom are going to interact with me and change my motion. Okay? So, if the two terms on the left represent kinetic and potential energy of the electron, the term on the right must represent the total energy. All of the mathematical modifiers of the wave function are usually abbreviated with the symbol H. Okay? We don't want to see all this other crap up here. We want to package it nice and neat. So we just say all of this stuff is H. And there's a reference to something, and you don't need to know this, but this is a special operator called the Hamiltonian. Okay? Um, and you'll learn about that if you take um, advanced topics in math. This is the, the Hamiltonian operator. And so what we say is all of this crap modifying the wave function equals the total energy of the wave function. As with any multivariable mathematical equation, we can plug in an infinite number of combinations of values for the variables. Okay, I can plug all kinds, an infinite number of values in for X, Y, and Z. Where is it at? But only certain numbers of these, limited numbers of these, provide me with what I'm going to call a solution. And the solution is the volume of space that we call the orbital. Okay? So only certain numbers plugged in here allow me to have the energy that the electron needs to create the standing wave. So only a limited number of these lead to actual solutions. So for a given atomic set of a system, the set of solutions to this equation provides us with the amounts of energy corresponding to the frequencies of wavelengths that will result in a standing wave. And I can say that my lowest frequency or my lowest energy is going to be that least complex standing wave. Remember the waves that we looked at yesterday in two dimensions? Okay, the least complex of these would have this energy, and it would be the energy of that particular frequency. The next level of complexity would be that energy and correspond to that frequency. So the wave function corresponding to each level of energy, this wave function is the set of points in space that defines the actual wave, and this is called an orbital, and this is the space that the electron can occupy. And this is as good as we can do, okay? Again, we can only say this is where the electron might be, or it's most likely to be. We can't say where it is exactly, but we know that it's going to be in this space somewhere. And within that space, we can actually create the probability that it will be at certain points within that space. The set of allowed energies or waveforms is determined by the interaction of the charges present within the atom, and so is unique to atoms of each element. I have a certain number of protons and a certain number of electrons, and that means I have a certain number of electrical and magnetic fields that are constantly interacting within that type of atom. So that set of waveforms is unique to that atom. And then again, any electron can pass from one standing wave to another by the absorption or loss of the correct amount of energy. If energy is released, it's in the form of a photon, which has the amount of energy corresponding to the specific transition. 
In addition to determining the energy of each allowed orbital state, the solution to this equation, the wave function, provides us with three quantum numbers that define the orbital. And this is where it gets into some information that you're going to need to know about. We need to know the principal quantum number. And that's the energy level of the orbital. Is it one, two, three? How many total possible? Based on the periodic table, how many energy levels? Seven. Seven. Okay. Actually, it's an infinite number. What? But we can go beyond eight or nine or ten energy levels, but we don't because we don't have enough elements to fit on the periodic table, right? Mm -hmm. After the seventh level, we just sort of stop there because we don't have any more elements. But theoretically, we could have as many elements as we wanted if we knew how to create them, right? We could have a continuation of the periodic table. So if we had an eighth um, row of elements, it would start with 8s, right? And that next element would have be in the eighth energy level. And that's the principal quantum number. Okay. The second thing is the angular momentum quantum number. And we won't really bother with this term, the azithmal quantum number. This relates to the shape of the orbital. Is it an S orbital? Is it a P orbital? Is it a D orbital? Is it uh, F orbital? Okay. And remember, you got a little bit of insight into what the shapes of those orbitals might be by seeing what the two-dimensional waves kind of look like. We remember that the S orbital is spherical in shape, right? The wave vibrates away from the nucleus towards the edge of the orbital and back again, right, in that three-dimensional space. This is the space that it vibrates in. In the P orbitals, we have three new ways that we can vibrate. Well, they're all the same way. They're just at different orientations, right? I vibrate within this orbital, or I vibrate within this orbital, or I vibrate within this orbital if I'm the P orbitals, okay? And that's what the, the angular momentum relates to. Then we have the magnetic quantum number, which relates to the three-dimensional orientation of the orbital. This is the basic shape of the P orbitals, but this one right here is P sub X because it's on the X axis. I'm sorry, that's P sub Y. P sub X is on that axis. And then P sub Z is up and down. That's on the Z axis. And this magnetic quantum number relates to what the orientation of this orbital is. Okay, so the principal quantum number limits the number of angular momentum states, which in turn limits the number of possible orientations. And we'll talk about that. Okay, your text also provides the following caution, an important point to keep in mind throughout this discussion is that the orbital in the quantum mechanical model bears no resemblance to an orbit in the Bohr model. An orbit is an electron's actual path around the nucleus, which doesn't exist, whereas an orbital is a mathematical function that describes the electron's matter wave. That's what we call this. We call this a matter wave, but it has no real physical meaning. Okay, any questions to this point? Okay, you don't need to know anything about the Schrodinger wave equation. You, you don't even need to know about the, the little detail of the, the wave function that we created. Um, but I, I sort of feel like it's important to go through something like that to give all of this a little bit of context. Okay, now we get to the part where 
we see what the important stuff is. So while the wave function corresponding to the given energy level gives, gives us information about where the electron can be, it cannot give us information about where the electron actually is. This is because we cannot both measure the position and the motion of the electron accurately enough to determine the uncertainty uh, according to the uncertainty principle. So when we realized this, when Heisenberg did this, we realized this, we recognized, you know what, I can't come up with a mathematical formula that's going to tell me where the electron is at any point in time. Let's come up with a function of some kind, though, that tells us where it can be. And that's what the Schrodinger wave equation did. But in addition to that, and you don't really need to know what this means physically either, if we square the wave function, okay, and again, you don't have to have any real idea what this means. If we square the wave function, this indicates the probability of finding an electron near a particular point, and this is going to be good enough because what this gives us is a picture of what the waveform of each energy level and orbital looks like. I still don't know where the electron is going to be in that representation, but I can get an idea of where this is going to, where, where it is probably going to be. So we can get a visual representation of the space around the nucleus where the electron is most likely to be by plotting an electron probability distribution, okay? And this is the plot of an electron probability distribution. And this outlines the shape of the S orbital. It looks like a sphere, right? But because of what we can do with the mathematics of this by squaring the wave equation, we can say the probabilities are most likely that the electron is going to exist within this much more dense inner area. It's going to be less likely for it to exist in these outer regions, region, regions of the, the waveform. Okay? So this is the shape of the orbital. The more intense the pattern of dots, the more likely the electron is at that location. Now, if we extend a line outward from the nucleus in any direction, we can also plot the probability of an electron versus being a certain distance from the nucleus graphically. Okay, and so we find out that for an S orbital, the probability is that the further we get away from the nucleus, the less likely the electron is there. Okay. The above representations show the probability of finding an electron at a, uh, any point in the three-dimensional space around the nucleus. So if I'm this far from the nucleus, the probability that I'll be within that space is this great. The above represents so. Um, we also want to know the total probability that an electron is a certain distance from the nucleus. That is, at a certain distance, what if we collected all the probabilities of the electron being that distance um, from the entire sphere at that distance? Let's see if we can make that make sense. Um, at a certain distance, what if we collected all the probabilities of the electron being that distance from the entire sphere at that distance? And I probably didn't, there's probably a comma that needs to go in there somewhere. What if we collected all the probabilities of the electron being that distance and I'm collecting all of those values from the entire sphere. Okay, so if I do that, what we find is that 
I can create a function like this, the radial probability distribution. And this is the thing that's going to be the most important for us. This is going to help us understand, this is going to help us understand some of the properties of electrons or some of the properties of elements. And it's the radial probability distribution. So if you want to like star that one or highlight that one in some way, that's the one that's going to be um, the one that's going to help us the most. The total probability that an electron will be a certain distance from the nucleus, as you can see based on this graph, the peak probability is actually a slight distance from the nucleus. Okay. Also note that the theoretical probability of finding an electron that distance from the nucle nucleus doesn't reach zero. It stretches infinitely. Okay, so there is a tiny, 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 tiny probability that my electron could be way out here. Okay, but what we do is we artificially cap how far we're going to say we're going to allow our distribution to be shown and we'll cap it at like 90%. Okay, so we'll say we don't really care about this extra 10% probability that this is going to be out here. We're going to draw our orbital or visualize our orbital based on this. And what's interesting about this is that even though this represents the outcome of a wave motion, the probability of an electron being in a certain place related to its wave motion, this peak here, <coughs> This peak here corresponds to the distance that Bohr calculated for the distance that that first energy level or that first orbit was away from the nucleus. So this actually has some physical meaning with relationship to the Bohr model, even though we don't have literal orbits of electrons the electron most likely will be at that distance from the nucleus. Okay, it'll be at that distance from the nucleus. This peak distance from the nucleus corresponds to what Bohr found for his radius of the first energy level. Okay, so we said also notice that Theoretically, the probability of finding an electron in the 1s orbital at a great distance from the nucleus approaches but never reaches zero. For hydrogen, the peak distance occurs exactly at a distance that Bohr predicted for the radius of his circular orbit. Okay, and then finally, is the probability of finding an electron in a low orbital never reaches zero no matter how far away it is. We limit the size. Sorry about that. Okay, that's annoying. We limit the size of uh, the visualization somewhere for practicality. Okay, let's stop there anyway. So I wanted to give you these Throw packets. Boo -boo. Marshall's the champion packet thrower. Yes. Okay, we've actually gone through a few of these first um, few things. You have had enough information and discussion to understand answers to questions up to about question 50. What I'm going to request that you do, I've given you all of the detailed explanations of all of these questions. 
what I'm going to request that you do is take this packet over break and read through the first 50 questions. Just do five questions a day. Okay? Just look at and try to understand what I've said about the concepts. This is a concept heavy chapter. Not nearly as much math, but there is a little bit of math too. Um, so try and understand the concepts that I've written out here for these. Um, the first 10 or so questions we've actually already done, uh, but go over them again. And then have an amazing break.